The silver lining. Okay, a quick status report. As of the end of January, my family was plunging into poverty. My brother had no immune system. My mom had no job. My dad was working about 90 hours a week and appeared to be on the verge of completely flipping out. The hottest girl in the eighth grade came to my house to tutor me and I booted her off my property. I was definitely going to fail my math final. But on a brighter note, my strange tragedy-induced popularity at school was growing. Word got around that Stephen Alper was the guy who kicked Renee Albert to the curb, and people just decided I must be the man. Annette was especially thrilled with the whole story for some reason. Maybe she figured she'd have no competition for tutor of the year now. Of course, every male I knew thought that sending Renee home made me the idiot boy of East Village Middle School, but they still felt an odd sort of admiration for me. It was like I had resisted the spell of fearsome enchantress. Everyone else was under that spell and couldn't resist it. So they assumed I had some secret strength. It didn't matter that they were wrong, that every time Renee walked into homeroom and glared at me, I was torn between two equally powerful urges to run up to her, drop to one knee and propose, or to run away from her and cry in the boys' bathroom for an hour. All they saw was a guy who sent the cheer queen packing. Weird. Annette met with me after school a bunch more times that last week. My brother and mom went to Philly and returned. I played drums and did homework. Meals got nuked and consumed. The sun rose in the east and set in the west. Numbness was setting in, but I had just enough oomph left to get me through finals. I wound up with A's and B's in English, science, social studies, and Spanish. A big fat D in math. Mrs. Galley called me into her office on Friday to break the news. Candy heart, Stephen? Last time I had been there, I practically had to donate blood to get a candy heart. Now she was leading off by offering me one. That right there was enough to tell me she hadn't sent for me so she could award me an honor roll t-shirt. What did I do wrong, Mrs. Galley? I made up every scrap of work in every class. I got a tutor. I studied like a monk. You got a 37 on your math final. Uh, how about that? I thought for sure I'd get at least a 39 with that extra credit problem about the two trains. Stephen, I'm truly sorry. You made an incredible effort right up until the end. Yeah, so did the dodo bird, the passenger pigeon, vanilla ice. How are your parents going to take this news? I know you were quite concerned about their reaction when you had all that homework to make up. Uh, I don't know, really. I've never gotten lower than a B plus before. But on the other hand, they were pretty caught up in my brother's situation right now. Maybe they just kind of won't notice? I'm sorry to break it to you, Stephen, but I have a feeling they'll notice this. I know. How are they going to find out? Are report cards getting mailed home today? Or will you call first? Or will I have a chance to tell them? Your report card is probably already in your mailbox. Do you want me to call them before they see it? Yes, please. You can get my mom on her cell phone. She's at the hospital with Jeffrey today, but she always has it with her. Please tell her I tried. Please? She said she would certainly advocate for me and then asked whether I wanted to be in the office for the call. I really and truly didn't want to sit there and watch the live action as my mom got disappointed in me, so I went back to class. I buried my head and got through the rest of the day, but the bus ride home felt like a condemned man's last walk. Of course, when I got home, nobody was there. The answering machine had two messages. Dad would be home by 10 p.m. and I should eat without him. Well, duh. And Mom and Jeffrey would be staying at the hospital another night. But I should call my mom's cell phone ASAP. Now here was an interesting dilemma. Should I call and face the problem or not call and enjoy a few hours of lonely, nerve-wracking boredom instead of my usual lonely, depressing boredom? 
I pondered that for about seven tenths of a second before finally going downstairs to play drums until dinner. While I was in the basement playing, it occurred to me that my mom might worry when she didn't hear back. But I just wasn't in the mood to consider somebody else's feelings at the moment. Unfortunately, it also didn't occur to me that my mom might completely spaz and send my dad home to check on me. Imagine my surprise when basement lights went out. I stopped playing, took off my headphones, and jumped up. The lights went back on. When my eyes readjusted, I was looking straight into the vengeful glare of an enraged accountant. Steven! It's 6.30. What are you doing? Um, playing drums? Why didn't you call your mother when you got home? Why should I? She's just going to yell at me for my math grade, right? You should have called her because when you didn't, she was afraid you'd disappeared or something, so she had me paged out of an important meeting. And I came charging home. This cost us about $200. And we don't have $200. It was irresponsible, Stephen. Ooh, irresponsible. That's like the dirtiest word an accountant can possibly say to his kid. I knew things were at a crucial point right now. What I said next would likely determine whether I'd be grounded until marriage or just lectured for a while and then ignored again. But every once in a while, you don't make the safest choice when you're 13. Irresponsible? Irresponsible, Dad? You really want to talk about irresponsible? I don't think you do. Who's the super responsible guy who hasn't actually talked to his firstborn son about anything in about four months? Who's the pillar of reliability who has left his 13-year-old to fend for himself for weeks on end? When was the last time you asked me about school, responsible man? When was the last time you went shopping for any food that can't be cooked using two minutes of radiation? Stephen, that's not fair. Fair? You banished me to the old folks' home for a week, and you want to talk to me about fair? Stephen, you know we had to take care of your brother. Now, I was in full-on attack formation. It was like I was playing some kind of Dad Devastator 3 video game or something. I just couldn't stop saying the coldest, meanest things that popped into my head. Who had to take care of my brother? Have you been playing board games with him every night instead of studying for school? Have you been kneeling with him in front of the toilet every time he throws up? Have you been sleeping at the hospital with him? Have you? I stopped for a moment and looked up at my father. Truthfully, I was kind of surprised he hadn't smacked me yet. What I saw wasn't quite what I, what I would have expected. He had sat down heavily on the basement steps and his head was bowed. He looked like a dog does right after you whack it with a newspaper. Um, Dad? Dad? His voice was a hollow whisper that I hadn't heard before and hoped I'd never hear again. You're right, Stephen. You're 100% right. I have not been talking with you and I haven't been taking care of anybody. I haven't been. I haven't. Since your brothers? Since October? This was the longest string of words he had uttered in months, but it suddenly dried up as if he just couldn't find any more to say. And then he looked at me with his tenderness that was also totally new to me, stood up and held his arms open. I know this sounds weird right in the middle of a fight and all, but I ran right into my dad's chest. After he held me for a while, I tried to speak. Dad, I don't want Jeffrey to... Then I cried until it was time for embarrassment, burritos, and a long call from dad to mom. When my father hung up, he looked much more like my old dad, my pre-October dad. He was still kind of talked out, but there was one more thing on his accountant brain. So about that math grade. The next day, mom and Jeffrey came home. When they walked in, they encountered a scene that must have been fairly surprising. My dad and I were playing chess at the kitchen table and there was a pile of my math stuff on one of the extra chairs. Dad had spent a couple of hours that morning getting me two chapters ahead in algebra. After I had explained the whole Renee Albert tutorial fiasco, he had felt sorry for his pathetic eldest boy. You sometimes forget how good your parents are at things. I mean, my dad did math for a living. 
365 days a year. So it made sense that he knew the stuff. But I mean, he really knew the stuff. Then when we were done, we celebrated with my first cup of coffee ever in the chess game. Weird. My parents would never have let me have coffee before Jeffrey got sick. If there's one thing I'd figured out about having a family crisis like ours, it's that the old rules no longer applied. For example, I had probably gone four months without eating a single vegetable, but there were times when I wished for new rules that did apply, like maybe take a vitamin every day so you don't get scurvy. I got all hyped up from the caffeine and won the game in about nine minutes, so my father got a chance to be impressed by me. And then when my mom and Jeffrey sat down at the table, it was like some kind of normal family moment or something, until my mom remembered she was mad at me. She asked my dad to take Jeffrey into the living room for some father-son bonding. Old dad was having quite the paternal morning, and then began lacing into me. But before she could build up a good head of steam, I cut her off and explained, how hard I had worked on the grades, how disappointed I was in myself, how I had turned away the world's most desirable math tutor for the sake of Jeffrey's health, and how my dad and I had already had it out about the not calling mom cell phone incident. What could she really say? Stephen, I love you, but never ever do this again. There, I could live with that. The rest of the weekend was pretty tranquil for a change. Jeffrey was on a new anti-nausea medication and the doctors had lowered his steroid dose, so he was feeling well enough to play more actively. Also, thanks to my little math mini-drama, both parents were looking right at me and even asking me questions about my life. Probably the coolest part was my drum lesson with Mr. Stoll on Saturday afternoon. My mom drove me instead of sleeping, which was her usual post hospital routine, and watched the whole lesson instead of going shopping or something. Afterward, she told me she'd had no idea how good I had gotten. It felt pretty nice to know that my last four months of being a practice pad maniac had made a noticeable difference. As things turned out, it was a good thing my mom had watched that particular drum lesson because it would be the last one we'd be able to afford for a long while. On Sunday, my cousins from New York City came over which they hadn't done in ages. My mom had called them when she noticed that Jeffrey was suddenly having a couple of good days and her sister had dropped everything to come see us while the opportunity lasted. I'm the oldest kid in our whole extended family, so I generally run around keeping the little ones from killing each other, but that day they all got along. I sat on our back porch drinking hot chocolate, thinking about Renee Albert and watching my brother and the cousins pound each other with snowballs for about 40 minutes an endurance record for Jeffrey this year. When they came in, we had a real family style dinner. My mom had even dusted off that big thing in the kitchen called the stove and people were laughing and joking around like we used to last year. I mean, an outside observer would notice that there was a puffy bald kid there and that the grownups kept pausing to look furtively at him, but the mood was lighter than it had been since the diagnosis. Anyway, Jeffrey even got my Uncle Neil to do his famous impression of Peter Pan and Captain Hook fighting over dessert, which he only want, only did once a year. It was a really nice time. Then Jeffrey started falling asleep at the table. I guess all that running around had been tough on his body. The adults were all taking their time over coffee and the cousins were in the family room watching Spongebob. So I took Jeffrey up to bed. Even though he was only half awake, I got... I got him to pee pee and brush his teeth. Then he went into his room to get his PJs on. He took off his shirt and I gasped. His arms were an alarming welter of dark bruises. I hadn't thought of it at the time, but I guess all of the snowballs hitting him had taken a toll, even through his thick winter coat. He glanced up at me with his look of total resignation that should never be on a five-year-old face. I felt so bad for him that I read him, two chapters of his favorite book, Flat Stanley, before I turned off his light. Later on, after the guests had left, I said goodnight to my parents and got ready to go to bed myself. 
I had been in a nearly great mood for about 36 hours, but unease was settling back in. When I was lying alone, lying down alone in the dark, I couldn't get comfortable for the longest time. I just kept seeing Jeffrey's arms over and over in my head, and it hit me. I had been in a dream world for a day and a half. But just because you get distracted by the silver lining for a little while, that doesn't mean there's not still a huge dark cloud behind it.